Alonzo and Francisco. Welcome to Psychedelics Today. We're really excited to have you on the show. Um, today we're going to be chatting about Alonzo's journey, but also about this new course that uh, we've put together, that Alonzo has put together, Ancestral Teachings uh, for the Psychedelic Renaissance. Um, so I would love to just hear a little bit about your journeys entering into this. And Francisco, since you were um, kind of on the back end, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll switch over to Alonzo uh, to, to chat about um, a little bit. Yeah, his journey here and how he got started. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you for having us. So uh, I started relating with plant medicines about five years ago, uh, doing ceremonies, and that eventually led me to Alonso through a, a medicine master from here, from Argentina, which is where I'm from. And I started reading Alonso's book and feeling very close to his teachings. And that led me to travel to Peru uh, last time and spend some time living at Alonso's place and uh, learning from him and helping in whatever way I could. And in that interaction arose the idea to create a course uh, for therapists in the United States to share some of Alonso's teachings and knowledge. And so we embarked on the journey of writing and producing this course that we're now going to put out through your platform. Awesome. Wonderful. <clears throat> and I would love to maybe hear from Alonzo on how he got started um, on his medicine journey. Um, empecé muy joven en el año, uh, 1900, I started very young in the year 1976 when I was 15 years old and was very curious of experimenting with these plants. And so he traveled to the jungle where he met a master called uh, Don Benito from the Shipibo uh, people. And that means that he's been taking plant medicines now for 47 years. Wow, <clears throat> amazing. Um, and Alonzo, is the main medicine that you work with is, I'm guessing since you said you got started in the Shipibo tradition, is that with ayahuasca? Like what type of plants do you typically work with? Mm. Well, um, aparte de ayahuasca, pues sí he probado muchas otras plantas. He's saying that aside from ayahuasca, he has tried many other plants like uh, wachuma, hikuri, yopo, mushrooms, and other plants that are not very known in the West. He also has served uh, all of those plants to other people. Amazing, amazing. Um, I'm, you know, this course that you've put together um, seems very unique. Um, I have, feel like I haven't seen too much of these kind of offerings in the psychedelic space and would love to just hear a little bit more about um, what was the intention on putting this course together um, and, and wanting to share this with the world. Mm -hmm. um, he had a, a formation with the Shipibo people with his medicines and he believed that Plants like ayahuasca are very important and should not le be left to the side. And he's saying that uh, ayahuasca requires a level of uh, like cleanliness, uh, hygiene, and um, you know rigor to it that many people in the modern world uh, don't take into account. This is why uh, it's a plant that should not be taken recreatively, because if one doesn't know the rules that rule it, um, it can cause harm. Yeah, I was I was curious to uh, you know hear more about uh, this idea that ayahuasca needs a little bit more cleanliness that maybe Westerners <clears throat> maybe aren't approaching it with, and um, yeah, could you talk a little bit more about that and maybe some perspectives on you know, the difference between some indigenous perspectives on ayahuasca versus maybe how Westerners really approach it. It sounds like yeah. you might work with a lot of Westerners coming down too. Mm -hmm. uh, yo creo que incluso dentro de las diferentes... I believe that even within the different ethnic groups within the Amazon that work with ayahuasca, some of them obey some rules or some other type of rules or have different sets of rules. Uh, but even within them, there are groups that just don't obey uh, these these rules as much and it's difficult to measure or know that if the people who don't follow these rules to call it somehow have access to the spaces of higher consciousness that ayahuasca allows awesome and i'm curious if you'd be open to sharing some of these rules well 
Dale, eh, En todo caso, según mi experiencia, en mi own personal experience of these 47 years, uh, following these rules has uh, benefited me. And are you open to maybe sharing what some of those rules are for those that like might not be, I don't know if they're too secretive or, um, yeah, I'd be curious to, to hear some of those rules. Bueno, eh, lo primero es eh, abstenerse de por vida. Some of these rules are considered to be to abstain ideally for life from certain foods that are very antagonist to ayahuasca such as uh, pork meat, uh, red meat from cow, uh, seafood, or very, very spicy food. Y luego, eh, Another important customary rule is to maintain a half day of fasting after the intake of ayahuasca. And it's also recommended to avoid all sexual activity three days before and two days after a ceremony. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So it sounds like, principales. yeah, the pretty kind of typical dieta. Mm -hmm. Those are the main ones. The main ones, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really curious because I started to do some research on um, dietas and I've always heard kind of conflicting things, right? We have, say... We don't want to eat foods that have tyramine in it um, because it could help to increase the blood pressure, headaches, and stuff like that. Whereas, like, there are some medical concerns with the dieta, but then also maybe some are rooted in belief. Um, and just kind of curious to to explore that a little bit. Like, where does the dieta come from? Did um, you know folks learn this directly from the medicine? Um, do we know that information? Um, it's very hard because it's only um, provable through personal experience. And my personal experience has taught me that when you don't follow the rules on a dieta, you become ill or even gravely ill. But it's further complex, it's even more complex because rules seem to apply differently, differently to different people. So there's some people that although they may infringe on a rule, might not experience uh, harm or consequences straight away. Yeah, that's super interesting. And that's like what I was, I guess, kind of reading about from different cultures, different perspectives on what to include in a dieta, um, you know, and some people seemed a little bit more flexible. But, um, you know, from my personal experience, I really kind of really tried to follow it pretty heavily. And um, I think I did, I did pretty well. And my experience felt a little bit more gentle, whereas I've heard other people that didn't really follow it had pretty, pretty tough times um, and became very, very ill. Um, so it's always been like a really interesting, I don't know, topic. I've always been really curious around like, where do these rules come from? How did, how did people come up with uh, this? And um, yeah, I guess maybe through years of experience, you start to realize um, what, what, what works and what doesn't work. It's very important on this point to separate between the two main um, understandings of the word dieta. The first one is the one that you asked about, which is the specifics of what to do before and after a specific ayahuasca ceremony. But there's also another concept for dieta, which is the long process that a person undergoes with different uh, master plants, or rather taking one master plant every day. Um, which is usually used to, you know, deepen in the relationship with ayahuasca. Right. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I, I do know that people talk about going on dieta where they start to diet, say, a certain tree or a certain plant. Um, so thank you for that clarification. There was um, a question that kind of popped in my mind a little bit earlier, talking about maybe the difference between <clears throat> some indigenous cultures versus the Western perspective. And I had this conversation with, um, I think they might've been an anthropologist a number of years ago and how they were saying that in the um, culture that they studied in, they didn't drink ayahuasca all the time 
they only drank ayahuasca when the community really needed it. And it almost was a community consensus. Um, and, you know, I'm curious to hear a little bit if, if you have a, a different kind of perspective around that versus maybe how Westerners are kind of doing it all the time and kind of for their own individual healing versus this perspective on more communal healing and getting a little bit of community consensus of should we go into these spaces um, to receive information or, or do healing on behalf of the community? So he's saying that we must make an important distinction, which is on the one side, the way in which ayahuasca has always been used by indigenous people and the reasons why they use it. And on the other hand, the use that we Westerners may do of ayahuasca and the way in which we're using it right now. But they are different matters. Mm -hmm. I also believe that there's a romanticization and e idealization from the West that believes that indigenous people that take uh, plant medicines or master plants immediately access uh, higher levels of consciousness. But in my opinion, this is not necessarily so. Could you expand on that a little bit more? I believe that the best reflection of the consciousness level of a person is the emotions that they allow themselves to have. So if people allow themselves to have hateful or revengeful emotions, then that means they are not in an elevated state of consciousness. And unfortunately, these hateful or revenge emotions are also common within the indigenous uh, plant medicine world. Yeah, I like that um, aspect of romanticizing and thinking um, you know, I think sometimes we put healers up on pedestals um, and we also have to remind, I think, ourselves sometimes that we're all human. And I remember when I attended my first uh, ayahuasca uh, retreat and ceremony, sometimes right after the uh, the ceremony, I would see the shamans go lay in the hammock and they were on their phones kind of scrolling through Facebook and keeping up with, you know, family and friends. And I thought, that's a really interesting thing. You know, I figured they would be doing something else. Um, and it kind of had me confront a little bit of that romanticizing. You know, these are very, you know, highly in, uh, evolved spiritual peoples and, and stuff like that. And then you also have to remember they have family, they have friends, they want to stay in contact. Um, and they also probably like technology just as much as, you know, Westerners do at times, right? Yeah. But I think, yeah, I think it's an important thing for um, maybe the Westerners to, to think about, too. How do we why do we romanticize um, indigenous cultures? Um, and is that always? Uh, yeah, is that always a good thing to do? Right. Um, I think about expectation management. Right. I think sometimes people that romanticizing really kind of puts people up on pedestals. Um, and how do we also think about the human human level of, of all this as mm -hmm. well? Um. So he's saying that uh, a common person, when they usually take ayahuasca, um, they, you know, will encounter their own viewpoints and they will start reviewing things about their life. And usually they encounter a feeling of love, of forgiveness for others. Um, but in the natural habitat of ayahuasca, this is not always the case, because many times with these medicines, the people that take them or administer them, they... Um, they have hateful feelings for other people or they even use ayahuasca to kill other people or to do harm and this is completely normal in their in their world and it is sometimes very hard to understand or conceive for westerners that the same plant could have such different uses and effects yeah, that's a really big thing. And I think about, um, you know, what, what I'm hearing you say is almost kind of like this concept of, of witchcraft, like um, how can these medicines be used for harm? And are these medicines always used for healing? Because um, I think, right, we have a perception that, oh, this is always used for healing. But are there cases where, um, yeah, they can they can be used for harm? Mm hmm. This true. Uh, he's asking Kyle if you would like to know more about the topic on witchcraft or or another point. 
I would love to, yeah, learn more about that perspective because I feel like we necessarily don't talk about it much from like the Western perspective in psychedelics. Um, and it is something that does come up, right? And I think as Westerners, it's like we're either afraid of that topic or it's like too taboo to, to talk about that <clears throat> these things can happen and maybe can be used in, in different ways. So I would love to hear, yeah, some of your perspectives on that, Alonzo, if you have any. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and entonces, so in the tradition that I was uh, taught in, which is the Shipibo tradition, there's two very distinct uh, characters. One is the Onaya, which is the good healer, and the other one is the Yube, which is the bad healer or the witch. And so uh, these characters are antagonists, and the Onaya not only has to heal people from natural sickness, but also very often from the disease or sickness that is generated from the Yube. And there's a third character, which is a person who is in between, who sometimes can be an Anonaya or sometimes can be a Yube, depending on who pays him and his own interests. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this is very different to the modern Western medical model in the sense that this is not just a doctor administering a, a prescription or a, a, a remedy, uh, but uh, an onaya, when, when they uh, face someone who is sick uh, from a yube, they have to confront energetically the yube and they are risking their own lives in trying to save that person which uh, I think is also relevant to say, Kyle, that there's a whole chapter on the course where Alonso talks about this and the differences between the modern Western doctors and the indigenous or traditional healers. And there's even a fourth character who is called the Muraya. And this is an ascended master. It is, it is an Onaya who has transcended the, the physical limits um, and that they are, you know, very, very knowledgeable masters that are not capable of doing harm and are not capable of hitting back someone. Um, but uh, they even transcend the physical laws and there might still be some of them, but just living inside of the jungle, outside of the contact of society. And he's saying that many people in the jungle have stories of seeing these murayas and seeing them uh, breathe underwater or even be able to fly or have these uh, powers very similar to the old tales of the yogis in India. So he says that uh, his master, uh, Benito Arevalo, told him that when he was a boy, he met murayas and that he saw them disappear in front of his eyes and that uh, sometimes in his village they would start hearing the singing of a muraya but the muraya was nowhere near them, but they knew that he was using the singing, um, you know, to, to kind of establish his presence there. Super interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing all that. <clears throat> um, you know, I guess thinking about it from a Western perspective, um, say folks are going down to Peru and Brazil to, to do ayahuasca, is this something that uh, Westerners should be more mindful of or be aware of? Um, how often does, say, like black magic or witchcraft happen? Um, and yeah, just thinking about safety of people that are interested in attending these retreats and, and experiences. Is this, is this a concern for, for people? Bueno, eh... It is very common in these cultures uh, that when a conflict is not resolved amicably between two people, one of them often goes to a yuve to take uh, revenge upon the person who harmed them. And so my teacher, he said that 60 or 70% of the illness that he had to heal was man-made, was created by other people as forms of revenge. He's saying that this is very hard to know uh, because usually not even 10 or 20 years can be enough to, for a human to know the duality that inhabits in another person. And if they are a Yuve or an Onaya or something in between, um, 
and that unfortunately these are very hard things to evaluate and and one must be very lucky to encounter someone who works in medicine and is truly noble about it. It is very important to follow our intuition in this matter and if any little thing um, you know makes noise to us or seems strange or off that it's better to err on the safe side and not work with that person i think that's a really great point <clears throat> i remember when i was in my undergrad um <clears throat> i was invited to a ceremony and i kind of had that intuition of like maybe not to go um and things just weren't aligning and I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't just go to this thing. And I found out during that ceremony, I guess the, um, the shaman ended up getting attacked by one of his previous teachers, um, during the ceremony and he ended up having to go back down. So he got violently ill, uh, during the ceremony and ended up having to go back down to Peru to his new teacher, uh, to, to get healing. And I think that was my first time hearing something like that, that, you know, attacks could happen from, you know, across the world, you know, a teacher down in South America and this person's up in Vermont. Um, and that was like, whoa, what's going on here? I never thought that was possible. Um, and so this topic, is just really interesting to me because uh, some personal experiences like that and, and hearing stories. Um, so thank you for, for sharing your experiences. On the on this topic, I guess, of um, I, I naturally think about <clears throat> energetic protection and energetic hygiene um, and thinking about how maybe the psychedelic renaissance is unfolding here in a more kind of medical um, perspective, <clears throat> also a little bit of self-discovery and healing, like people are kind of doing their own ceremonies and kind of creating that. Um, are there any risks of kind of doing that um, without maybe proper training or just from a more kind of like Western mindset? Should we be thinking about energetic protection? How do we cleanse energy? How do we, you know, protect the space? Um. He's saying that um, it is, he believes that it is very hard for a, a Western person to be able to protect themselves against someone who has true power because a person in ceremony might visualize protection or spheres of light, but this is just their imagination. And their true power uh, may still be way below the power of a person who might be on the dark side. However, a person who lives a coherent life and who has climbed the levels of consciousness throughout his life through different ways um, could be protected from such a power and their, their efforts will probably concede them a greater power than that of a witch. To put it on other terms, we can imagine the mind as having three distinct levels and witches can access maybe the top third level of the mind. Uh, but on top of the mind, there's a fourth level, which is beyond their reach. Yeah. Anyway, over the four level, no, what we is a beautiful coincidence with the Hinduist system. The four level is the heart, and in the heart, nobody can touch you. But many people uh, have this confusion you know, about, I am very high, I am a good person, but um, don't can see the, the, this moment, a specific moment when we are uh, unconsciousness, you know, when we are not a good person, but we have a very... Um, different um, perception of ourself, you know? So I feel like that really stresses like the ongoing <clears throat> inner work that um, people need to do, especially for those that are becoming practitioners in the West, to be really aware of what's showing up, their thoughts, their yeah, judgments and, and all that stuff. Because it sounds like that can have an impact in session, say if a, a psychedelic therapist is having all this stuff bubble up, could that be transferred onto a client? Um, 
And, you know, maybe it's a different perspective versus like a shamanic, a shamanic perspective versus like a Western perspective, but that transference could continue to, to happen if people aren't aware of it. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm I'm really excited uh, about this course um, and what you've put together here. I think it's going to be uh, a huge value offer to the community, to folks that are listening, um, to be able to bring a lot of these perspectives in. Um, there was something that me and Francisco were talking about, um, and I would just to love to hear some of your thoughts, but this um, idea uh, about consciousness and, and uh, conscious work versus healing. Um, and Francisco is uh, discussing a little bit about your perspective on that, that, you know, we're not maybe always doing healing work, but we're working with consciousness and, and um, yeah, working on that level. And then the healing happens with that. So yeah, I would just love to hear some of your perspectives on um, that, that aspect of healing versus maybe doing work with consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, sí, hazme el, el resumen. Uh, Alonso says that for him, uh, healing is the same as the expansion of consciousness. Uh, in the sense that if we have an expanded consciousness, then we are going to be in health. Uh, our immune system is going to be strong. We will be able to repel sickness, even viruses. Um, and this is all about a coherence, about maintaining an internal coherence for the person. Expanding our consciousness means expanding our perception and becoming aware of many more things, uh, such as the inexorable relationship between spirituality and our responsibility for the planet and uh, all of nature and that these things cannot be uh, put entonces... aside. so you could even measure your consciousness by your ecological footprint that's i love that um I yeah, I feel like that's so important to think about because I feel like so many of us are so disconnected and sometimes we don't even think about what we're doing to the ecosystem. Um, there was um, a quote in a podcast uh, that I, I recorded with um, this guy, um, John Buchanan, and he had this quote, it's like, when we stop feeling the aliveness of nature, we stop feeling alive. And just thinking about how when we just treat nature as if it's, you know, whatever, um, how, yeah, we start to become sick, start to become very disconnected. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's beautiful. Um, Alonzo, I want to respect your time. Um, and I know you're also kind of working a little bit off your mobile hotspot. So thinking about your, your, the, the, the data, um, as well. So, um, I would love to hear a little bit more about what are you excited about with, uh, the course that you've put together? Um, and yeah, what, what would you want listeners to know about the course that, that, that we'll be launching? Mm-hmm. Bueno, eh, lo principal para mí es... My main objective with this course is uh, to be able to share with this new generation that is starting to work with sacred plants and entheogens abroad um, because I was privileged enough to be able to meet a world that doesn't exist anymore. And so I was able to accumulate knowledge that I believe is very important to transmit in all the possible formats. Beautiful, beautiful. And how about you, Francisco? I know you've spent so much time editing the videos. The videos are beautiful um, in nice H high def 4K. Um, and then it's in subtitles. And you know, I'm sure that you spent yeah lots of time studying with Alonzo and editing these videos. What are you most excited about? Um, well, I'm very excited for um, everyone to be able to see these, these courses. Um, because I think that Alonso really invites us to contextualize our use of entheogens and psychedelics within our life. And to, um, I think it's, I think the course is a really good medicine for the myopic obsession that a lot of the West has, and which I have had in the past with psychedelics, thinking that they are a silver bullet that are gonna heal us from all of our darkness and illnesses. and. Like Alonso just said, you know, it's like you can measure your consciousness from your ecological footprint. So I just think that this course is very grounding and it's at the same time very mystical and it defies our notions of what is real or what is possible because some of the perspective he brings really pushes the boundaries of what our paradigm believes to be possible. 
and at the same time is very humbling and very grounding in the sense that it's always bringing us back to like, okay, but what are you going to do tomorrow? And what are you going to do when the ceremony is done? And how are you going to carry that into the world? And I think that is very, very needed, not only for therapists and guides, but also for anyone who is trying to heal, you know, in any way possible. Those are sometimes the most important questions to ask oneself. What are you going to do after the ceremony, <laughs> right? How are you going to integrate this in, into your life? Um, and Alonzo, any final words of wisdom that you want to share um, with with our audience today? Or any final thoughts? Uh, sí, que, pues yo creo que... He currently likes to refer to these plants and pla as plants of power. And that's something that really is important for him is... Um, for us to understand that these plants allowed ancient cultures to not only strengthen their culture, but also to achieve things, feats that are incredible and to develop technologies in the past that are outside of our understanding. And so that he wishes to create a documentary soon to talk and explore all these matters because in the face of the existential crisis that all of humanity is facing right now, he believes that we need extraordinary help in order to make it through and that these plans uh, could be that help. Amazing message. And how about you, Francisco? Anything that you want to close with for today? Thank you for your time. And thank you to everyone who has listened. Yes. And I want to thank you both for your yeah. time. Thanks for, for making this work. It's been a real joy. Oh. Really appreciate your time, all your wisdom that you've shared with us. And we'll catch you next time. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you.